Fun Experience community, Fleet Feet community, we have a great and final Together We Move live show. Ashley, can you believe it? I know, I can't believe it. We have been, we are on a roll with these Friday shows. Yeah, this is in conclusion, man. And what a great guest to have on our final show. Totally. Um, Ali Ostrander um, is awesome. Like I didn't actually know that much about you before we started, but just the more I dug in, I the more excited I am for this conversation and to get to know you a little bit more. Yeah, and for those of you who don't know, um, Ali is from Alaska and is a standout steeplechase runner. I think you have won more consecutive um, steeplechase championship titles than any runner in history. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so welcome to the show. <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm not. No, no, I'm really excited to be here, and I love what you guys are doing. So glad to be a part of it. That's awesome. So before we get into our conversations and more, because it's this is going to be a fun one, guys. Um, we just want a quick reminder of what this whole Together We Move thing is all about. This is something that we started on April 1st. It was not an April Fool's prank. The prank's <laughs> on us because the darn thing keeps on going. But we have been launching new workouts pretty much each and every day featuring really awesome guest runners and coaches. Uh, it's been hosted in the Run Experience app. You can still download it and access those workouts uh, today. And we're finishing things off on Fleet Feet's My Big Virtual Run, which also happens to coincide on uh, Wednesday, which is Global Running Day. Yeah, and um, super exciting. Um, the My Big Run is a virtual race where you get to choose your distance from one mile to a marathon. We um, are doing this race in partnership with Brooks, and um, it just costs $10 to enter. And with that entry, you receive a $15 voucher to your local Fleet Feet. Um, and you also have the option to donate to Girls on the Run International. So really great event. Um, you can register all the way through Wednesday um, and We'll get into some more information about that later in the show. We will. And yeah. a quick shout out. Some of you guys are already asking about the giveaway in the end because we've been doing really awesome giveaways uh, all spring. And Ashley, thank you to you and Fleet Feet for bringing all these great brands and partners to the table and sharing them with our collective running community. I think we're finishing off appropriately with a, with a bang. What is this week's giveaway? So we have for two winners, um, and you must be present in order to win at the end of the show, um, two winners will receive a virtual fit at a, from Fleet Feet, um, and that will include a pair of shoes and socks. Um, a virtual fit is just like if you were going into a running store um, to have someone um, look at your, analyze everything about the way that you move and find the perfect shoe for you, but you get to do it virtually. Um, and so it is it's the perfect way to get fit for shoes during a time of social distancing. So that's one thing. And the other thing is what, Nate? An annual membership to the Run Experience app where you can get uh, workouts and programs from us, perfect virtual training for our new virtual lives. <laughs> uh, I've been busting my butt on a new program that I'm just about to launch. So if you win and get in there, you can see that sucker launch next week. Uh, and again, the link is in the description to go ahead and sign up for the giveaway. But enough about all this stuff, like let's start talking to Allie. Um, Allie, you, we just kind of wanted to start with your roots a little bit. You know, you came from Alaska. Uh, we saw that you grew up running um, the Mount Marathon. And we just wanted to know a little bit more about that event for those who don't know what it is and also just kind of how you got into running. Um, yeah, so I am originally from Alaska. I lived there for the first 18 years of my life before I went to college at Boise State. And uh, Mount Marathon is a huge Alaskan mountain running race. It is based in Seward, Alaska, which is about two hours from my hometown. And um, the name of the mountain is actually Mount Marathon. So that's where the name of the race comes from. It is not a marathon distance, okay. thank goodness. <laughs> um, it's three miles long and that is enough. If there were another 23, I don't know if I would have ever finished it. Um, but yeah, it's a really cool mountain race, just like an awesome atmosphere. It's a brutal course and pretty technical and really difficult, super steep grade. Um, but it's just like the Super Bowl of Alaskan mountain running and people get hyped for it. Um, and the town of Seward goes from like, 
like 5,000 people to 60,000 in one day, just everyone's there for the race. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a really fun thing to be a part of, and I hope to race it again someday. Yeah. How I was going to just ask a quick, I know Ashley's going to get your follow up questions no, you're good. too, but how old were you when you first did it? Mm, I think I was 10 or 11. Um, but there's a junior race. So the juniors only go halfway up, um, whereas the seniors go all the way up. And I did the junior race, I think, seven or eight times. Uh, and then my first year doing the senior race, it was pretty depressing passing the junior turnaround and having to like continue going for twice as long. Uh, you know, it, was, it was a hard thing to do for me. I mean, the Mount Marathon is like one of the hardest mountain races, I think, period. I mean, I know it's, it's what it's, you said 3.2 miles or just over three miles or two and a half miles, I think. But yeah, how I much vert? But it's, yeah, it's so steep and exposed. Like that's a tough thing to do as a kid. Um, yeah. So depending on the route you take, it's between three and three and a half miles. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the vert is 3,022 feet. Uh, and that's actually, it starts off with a a road kilometer and ends with a road kilometer. Um, so the vert is in just a little over a mile. So it's like very steep. <laughs> very steep. Wow. So did you grow up running on like just sort of wild trails and places in Alaska? Like how did you transition into running track? Uh, yeah, I mean, I still had like, you know, normal trails and stuff. It wasn't like I was always just running up a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> so I ran on the bike path or like the local trail system um, and then did, you know, school sports like cross country track. And uh, I think that mountain running was more of a family thing. Like my parents really enjoy hiking. And so they would take my sister and I to do that. And um, so that was kind of how I got into Mount Marathon. But I, I had been into track before I ever did Mount Marathon. Mm hmm. So do you still enjoy trail running now, like on your easy days or things like that? Or do you, like, I know some track runners maybe steer away from, from trails because you could get injured or if you roll your ankle mm -hmm. or things like that, but do you, do you still do those sorts of things in your training? Um, yeah. So, uh, coach Danny Mackey actually kind of like writes it into my training. Um, when like right now I've been cross training and so hiking is kind of something I've avoided, but, mm. um, I was healthy and running. He would ride in usually one day a week, like, okay, you can cross train or you could go hike. And, um, and he knows that that's something that I really enjoy and like enjoying your training is a really important part of being successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. So I was gonna, I was gonna say, um, with, uh, steeplechase, how did you get into the steeplechase event? Uh, so my freshman year of college, um, the, the second semester I got injured and then the first semester of my sophomore year, I also got an injury. Um, so it ended up being about a year of an injury cycle. And when I was coming back to a racing track, um, my coach and I thought it would be fun and help take some of the pressure off to just try an event that I had never done before. Mm. Um, and so I decided to try out the steeplechase. And I mean, also my sister did it in college. So like mm. I had seen it before and kind of knew about it. Um, but yeah, I just decided to try it out and see how it was. And then I ended up really enjoying it. I mean, it's a fun event and really unique. There, there isn't another event that's like it really. Yeah, there really isn't. Um, I think I ran the steeplechase once and I was like approaching that water jump, like, oh my gosh, I don't know where I'm going to land. Like there's this strange incline and all this water and oh my gosh, like this obstacle isn't going to move. Can you, <laughs> can you like walk us through kind of what maybe like approaching those steeples? Are they called, what are they called? Are they called steeples and are they called obstacles? Uh, yeah. I, I usually call them barriers. Barriers. Uh, yes. <laughs> what you're talking about. Yeah. It would make sense if they were called steeples because it's yeah. steep chase. So, you know, really whatever you want. Whatever. <laughs> but what but is yeah. it like? Yeah. Approaching those. Yeah. 
I had a similar experience my first time ever trying to jump the water jump. I actually ran up to it and just stopped and was like, mm, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it wasn't in a race, luckily. This was this was three days before I actually raced it. So I had time to, you know, overcome that mental barrier and then the physical barrier. But mm -hmm. yeah, um, the, the water jump especially could be a little bit intimidating. Um, when I'm racing, um, the, the normal barriers, I usually just try to kind of like uh, attack them. So you don't want to be slowing down or stutter stepping as you approach, because if you can maintain your speed, then yeah. um, it's easier to get over. And then you're, you know, in a better spot coming out the other side as well. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as the water jumps go, you usually want to accelerate into those so that you can get a strong push off and not land too deep in the water. Yeah. Um, but I think water jump is like kind of a weakness of mine and something that I'm always trying to improve on. Yeah. You know, that's so interesting because with like so much racing, you know, it, there's so much of a focus on really steady effort, maybe minus like that, that finish line kick or that fast start. But every time you hit an obstacle, like not only are you pinned because it's a 3K distance, so you're running fast, but then you have these like big jumps every time you hit a barrier. Like how do you prepare for that? Uh, yeah, so that's kind of like in college, I feel like I didn't have much steeple specific training. Uh, like I never did a workout with hurdles in it or anything like that. Um, just kind of practiced a little bit of technique every once in a while. Um, and so going into this outdoor season, which is now kind of a wash, I'm not really sure what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, but Danny and I were talking about ways that I could prepare um, in workouts for that uneven pace that comes with running the steeplechase. Mm -hmm. um, going around some ideas like having workouts where you're like alternating lap splits with like faster and slower, um, you know, putting hurdles into workouts and stuff like that. Um, just to get your body used to kind of an undulating pace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, when you look up steeplechase, for those who are like me who don't have a lot of experience with it, you quickly see steeplechase fails show up in the search <laughs> results. So could you explain to our lovely audience what steeplechase fails are and if you've had any personal experience with them? <laughs> So I actually haven't had a personal experience with the steeplechase fail, which is, I'm very fortunate and like, you know, I'm not trying to curse myself by saying that. Um, I came really close uh, a couple of times, both times at nationals. I think like the more nervous I am for a race, uh, the more likely I am to have a fail. But basically what a fail is, is usually what happens is it's on the water jump and Someone goes to step on top of it, but their foot misses and they maybe like clip their toes on the front or the back side of it. And they end up just face planting into this large pit of water. Um, and usually there's a lot of collateral damage as well. Mm -hmm. Like everyone around them, might, it might turn into a pile up <laughs> sorts of opportunity there for terrible stuff to happen. Um, and it's really hard not to think about that every time I'm going over the jump, like, hmm, this could go so badly. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to I try to think a little bit more positively, but that's definitely always in the back of my head. Oh, man. <laughs> have, you, have, have you ever benefited from a fail? Like, where, like, you, there was, like, a pileup that you, like, skirted around and all of a sudden you went from, like, eighth place to, like, second or something? Uh, no, I haven't. But, like... So at USA's last year, I think Marissa Howard was in fifth place and, you know, the, like the top four went and she fell on one of the water jumps. Like I didn't see it. Because she was a little bit behind me, but I mean, that gave me a little bit more of a cushion, like going into the last few laps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to go back to something that you said earlier um, before we got into all the all of the steeple stuff. You said that you really felt like training should be really fun and that should have like, no matter what that needs to be a part of your training. And I've heard you say that several times now, um, like that the steeplechase is a very fun and unique event. Um, mm. what does that look like for you? And like, how do you find fun in your training, especially now that you're, that this is your job? Yeah. Uh, well, I think that like a huge part of enjoying training is enjoying the people that you're with. And like, Right now, that hasn't been able to happen as much, but um, 
like my roommate is also on the team, Chris and Nelson. So like, we live together, quarantine together. And uh, so it's really fun to like go on runs together. Um, mm -hmm. And when the whole team's together, like to have the whole, all the whole girls team, like going out for a run, you know, we'll have a lot to talk about and um, just, you know, goof off. Um, and obviously with the guys team too. Um, but then another part of it is just like, really having an appreciation for the sport. And I think that like going through multiple injuries has kind of done that for me, that I am way less apt to take running for granted. Mm. And like every time I'm out there practicing and getting to, you know, do this for a living right now, um, I'm, I'm really thankful for it. And like, I truly do love running. So it's not hard to make it fun. <laughs> I enjoy it. Uh, yeah. And yeah, it, it is a difficult sport. And like, there are days where you feel better than others. But I think the the net result is that, yeah, it's just it's just a fun thing to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so we wanted to, there's a few things we wanted to get in there. We want to talk about some of your how your body's been feeling just through different training and development and, and just the different injuries you've had in the past. But we want to talk about your move out of college and into professional racing. And correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, but it, it seems like you made the jump to pro racing before you finished your college season or career. Um, yeah. So last year was technically my junior year of athletic eligibility. Um, and then I decided to sign with Brooks after that was over. Uh, and part of my decision was just that um, I felt like I had I had had a good college career and I felt pretty satisfied with it. And there were opportunities available to go mm. pro, and it had been a huge goal of mine for um, for you know a lot of my time in college. Um, and so you know a dream of mine before I even went to college. And so. For me to like turn down the opportunity to go pro was um, it was pretty hard to do. And then additionally, I I saw you know myself as um, kind of needing a little bit of a change and um, a different group of people to really mm -hmm. push me in order to get to that next level and give myself a chance at making the Olympic team. Um, what would have been this summer, but will now be next year. Uh, so. Yeah, like when Brooks contacted me and I went and visited, I, I felt really good about it. I appreciated um, the brand and what it stood for and the coach and the team seemed fun, but like really focused and mm -hmm. like it just seemed like a good fit and I didn't see many reasons not to go. Wow. Yeah. What has been your favorite thing so far about running with the Brooks Beast? Like what is, what kind of differentiates that group for you now or like? just sort of stands out if you were describing them to someone else? Um, you know, there, there are a lot of things that I really enjoy about it, but um, like, I really enjoy the dynamic. I think, especially on the women's team, we have a good mix of people from different event areas um, and just with different personalities that it's nice we don't get, like, too competitive with each other and it just stays, like, fun and we're able to be really productive and push each other in practice um but also enjoy time like outside of practice and um not wanting to like drop each other you know that's never the goal mm -hmm. yeah that's really that really like adds on to this whole idea of just like training being fun it, it seems like mm -hmm. and, and brooke seems like such a natural fit there too thinking about like just their whole philosophy on running and it just being such a, um, I almost think yeah. it was like this joyful experience when I think about Brooks. Yeah. You know, yeah. Oh, sorry. I was going to say like, I want to, I just wanted to add to that. Like, I think as all runners of all levels, especially for, you know, newer runners who are later in life getting into the half or full marathon, as soon as they sign up for an event, they're training for something, whether it is an artificial sense or some of this real, like, we all can feel a little bit of that pressure uh, on us. And and sometimes we do it on purpose. It's like, oh, it's nice to have this drive. I'm going to be a little nervous. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to compete where people are going to watch me. And yeah, they'll love me anyways if they're my family, hopefully. Uh, so, you know, the race, it doesn't matter. But at the same time, it does. And I was just wondering how you have sort of managed that pressure over your career. Like, 
was it something that you used to get really nervous through in college? Like, and then how did it transition to when you started to go from college to pro? Like, did that change at all for you? Or is it just like, ah, oh, racing is racing? Uh, yeah, I think it, it, it did change like through each stage of my running career, like high school to college to now pro. Um, and then it also just changes like between races. N naturally you have some races that have, you have more expectations for yourself or it's been more of a focus. Um, so I'd get more nervous for those races. Mm. Uh, then, you know, there's some times where like you're just hopping in off event race and there's less pressure there or, um, you know, maybe like for me when I'm in a really big race and like, I'm the like 18th seed or something like I don't get as nervous. Cause I'm like, well, all I really need to do is just hang on. And like, hopefully I can surprise some people and myself, but like, I think races where I'm like ranked near to the top are definitely mm. one to get more nervous for. Mm. Uh, but one huge thing that helps me is, is just like, getting really excited about having those nerves and knowing that those nerves mean that there's a huge opportunity in front of me um, and that I'm ready for it. And my body knows it's coming and it's primed and raring to go. Um, and that for me, just like viewing nerves in more of a positive light is really helpful. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's such a valuable nugget. Like if you just thinking about younger runners out there too, who, who do feel really nervous or actually any of us who feel nervous before a race, like um, kind of coming up with a mantra to take, to take your nervousness, make it into something positive. Is there something that you say to yourself too, like any sort of line at the, that you say at the start line to help yourself really tap into that? Um, you know, like it kind of depends like um, which race it is or the day, like I'll have maybe some different mantras, but one thing that, kind of resonates with me and I like to repeat to myself uh is just a single word just capable um and I just like to remind myself that I'm capable um and I'm on the line for a reason and I belong there that's kind of what that word means to me that's, that's awesome cool. that's really cool uh does that something I know that as athletes uh through different parts of career, like we're working on different things where it's like, oh man, I have to work on my strength and my mobility. Or for some, it is like their mental game. They realize they've gotten to a certain level and they're like, oh, you know what? Like I actually need to, to work on how I mentally approach my training and my competitions and get into like that better mental state. Have you found for you that that's come pretty natural on the mental side? Or have you like, do you have like teammates or coaches in the past that like, oh, they were so good at helping me develop this strong mental game? Uh, I think that some of what I do is more natural, um, but there have obviously been like tidbits from coaches um, and teammates throughout the years. And I think that mental game is something for me that kind of like I've definitely had really strong races where I was mentally tough and, and races where I faltered. And I think that like having that consistency is something that I would like to work on. Um, and you know, they talk about how mental, uh, aspects are so important in running and that you should really be training that just like you're physically training and, you know, spending time with mental imagery or practicing, you know, anchoring and stuff like that. Um, and so uh, th that for me is something that I want to start trying to put a little bit more time towards, you know, like just 10, 15 minutes a day of really focused, like mm -hmm. um, trying to strengthen that aspect of my running. Because um, I feel like I'm pretty good with it, but uh, I could definitely be better. Yeah, there's, um, I, I know that you've spoken up about comments, like there were comments made that you look too young to be a pro runner um, or a commentators commenting about like certain body things like that. Um, and you spoke out against that because you were like, like, what was your response to that? Cause I think that comments like that can be very, like if we take those to heart, they could be detrimental, but they're, mm -hmm. it's like not the right place for someone to be saying that necessarily to like, yeah. What, what is your response to all that stuff? Yeah. Um, well, so for people that don't know, last year at Nationals, well, so a couple years at Nationals, 
um, my appearance was commented upon. Um, one time I would, the commentator said that it looked like I still played with Barbies. Um, and then another and year. This is, and this is on ESPN. Yes. Right? These are commentators on ESPN, a nationally broadcasted race. And you have commentators saying these things. Yeah, and then they were also um, repeatedly saying my height and weight during the race, um, which they also didn't have the correct height or weight. Um, so I don't know where they got their numbers, but uh, they weren't correct. And I, I mean, my reaction to it was that I was pretty frustrated because I work really hard all year um, and I'm not working at, you know, how old I look or um what my body looks like in the uniform. Like I'm working to improve my performance and run faster times than I have. My training doesn't revolve around my appearance. Um, and so I wanted the commentators to focus on my ability as, a, as opposed to my body. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that really it's just a lack of preparation on their part that they don't have anything else to say about me as a runner um, or anyone else in the field. Or, you know, it's an incredible field of of really talented young women and we're at nationals and everyone has spent a year preparing for this. And the only thing that they had to say was that, uh, that I was the, what, whatever my height and weight were like, mm -hmm. it's just, um, it, it's not like they can do better. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, overall my reaction, frustration. Um, yeah. So when I made the post about it and kind of stated those thoughts, there was such an overwhelmingly positive reaction um, from everyone. Not that they were like, oh, yes, this is great that that is what they said. But they were like, oh, I've experienced something really similar to this and I'm tired of it, too. And I think that like raising that awareness and letting commentators know the impact of their words can only help for the future. Yeah, I mean, looking at like young women coming up in the sport and women who are up against this sort of this, that this happens to women more often than men, obviously, and, and commentating situations like this, like, what do you, what do you say to like, what do you hope I guess will happen next in the sport to like kind of be more of an equalizer with that? Is there? Uh, yeah. I mean, I just hope that, in the future, people will recognize that women are successful because of hard work, dedication, perseverance in the sport, and not because of how they look or uh, what uniform they wore, how they did their hair, things like that. Uh, and I think that you runners that are entering the sport or, or maybe even already coming up against this, because, I mean, I received comments like that when I was in high school and you know, paper reporters not asking me what my workouts were, but asking me, like, how much I weighed and how tall I was and stuff like that. Uh, I think it's just really important for them to know that these comments should not impact the way that they are preparing for the sport, because whatever they're doing, it's it, it doesn't have to mean anything for their appearance like that yeah. shouldn't shouldn't be the focus yeah yeah for sure so we wanted to talk a little bit about you know you kind of highlighted your journey from regular track into steeplechase about you know the you're oh you were starting your body like you had trouble or you had some injuries come in and and then when you got into steeplechase you know like i wanted to just follow up just like did your body feel better when you started steeplechase running versus regular track and, and I know that you've kind of battled some other injuries over the years. So I just wanted to like talk about that just a little bit. Um, I would say that, uh, like my training when I, uh, like I kind of mentioned this, my training for like steeplechase or regular track events was really similar. Mm. So I'd say that my body felt about the same. Um, my training like did change after injuries though, um, for a while, I was much lower mileage. I incorporated a lot more cross training and running on the underwater treadmill. Mm. And then also started doing more um, strength training, weightlifting, just to, you know, try to increase overall strength and um, avoid injuries. 
And, you know, like, I, this is coming from someone who's like had a career of batting down different injuries. Was it like, one major thing or was it always like little fires? Like you'd go for a little while. It's like, Oh, like my shin or my knees bother me a little bit. Like I just have to like cool it for a couple of days or these injuries you've had where you're like, Oh man, I can't like finish my season. Yeah. So, um, I had, so the ones that I had in college, um, second semester freshman year and first semester sophomore year were both pretty big injuries where like, you know, my season wasn't going to happen. Uh, I had to take like a long period off of running and just cross train. Uh, But then I had another injury my junior year, um, academic junior year. And uh, that one was like smaller, something that I could kind of run through. Like I had to alter training a lot, but I was still able to have a season. Um, And that's kind of how my Achilles has been for the last Mm -hmm. year as well. It was something that I could run through and it was just really hard to manage, but I was able to do it. Mm. Uh, and then when I had the extra time with the Olympics being postponed a year, I just figured like, we better just nip this now. Like I'm not going to have another period of time with like this much downtime ever. Mm. So mm-hmm. yeah, just take advantage of that. Okay. So that makes me want to transition into a few rapid fire questions. If you all are ready for that, because we have some around cross training that I think might mm. fit. Okay. So questions from the crowd. So the way we do this, Allie, we ask you a question and you have a sentence or less to answer. Okay. Okay. Um, so what is your favorite kind of indoor cross training? Elliptical. What's the best advice you've ever received? Ooh. I could be running or otherwise, actually. Uh, this is a big question for I one second. That <laughs> is true. Now, just thinking about it. Um, I would say just to appreciate running. I like that. Um, That's it. A- do you miss living in Alaska and how do you stay motivated to train in winter months? I miss the summer in Alaska and I stay <laughs> motivated to train in the winter by not living in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any pre-race superstitions? Um, Kind of. I always wear the same sports bra. Well, I did, but now my racing top is pretty much a sports bra. So, I, I mean, it, they're slowly fading because I used to wear the same socks, but now I don't wear socks with my spikes. And I don't know. And maybe yeah. I need something new. <laughs> um, we have to ask favorite ice cream shops. Okay, so Seattle. Oh, this could be a long answer. I'll keep it short. Mm. Mm-hmm. what's your favorite ice cream flavor or okay top three favorite flavors mm. so i'd say like salted caramel blondie um yeah. pistachio and then like peanut butter cheesecake Ooh, yeah that's good yeah. and let's do let's do one more before we go into our little uh commercial break uh which pro runner, uh, current, retired, historical, would you want to go running with? Um, so many options. Yeah, man. You know, I guess now that I'm with Brooks, I'd want to go with Des. Uh, she seemed, I mean, I've always thought she was really cool, but now we've got that Brooks connection, um, and it would be really fun to hear more from her. All right. Well, Desi, if you're watching and listening, <laughs> you make this happen. Um, we do want to take a quick commercial break. Uh, thank you all of you guys for watching our live show. Uh, thank you to Brooks for bringing uh, Ali on and Fleet Feet for our awesome giveaway. Uh, there's a link down below in the description of this video. We'll also make sure we post in the comments and you can get a really awesome virtual shoe fitting appointment from Fleet Feet that includes the pair of shoes that you end up getting fit for, a pair of premium socks, and then an mm-hmm. annual membership with the run experience so that you can put those shoes to good work. And we're gonna do a live drawing in a little over 15 minutes. So you definitely wanna be one of those two lucky people. 
stick around. Yes. Um, and also, I just want to call out again, for those of you who are just joining us, um, about My Big Run, which is a virtual race celebration on Global Running Day brought to you by Fleet Beat and Brooks. Um, you can sign up. It's $10, and you receive a $15 voucher to your local Fleet Beat. There's a link in the description below that you can follow to register. Um, you also have the option to donate to Girls on the Run when you register. Um, we have raised over $30,000 so far for Girls on the Run International, um, which is so cool, you all. And just $30 helps a girl in need have a pair of shoes for a whole year. So yeah, if you donate, cool you're something great. Yeah. Um, so all that said... Um, since Brooks is one of the sponsors of this event, and Brooks is your sponsor, Allie, um, I wanted to ask you um, what, like, some of your favorite pieces of gear, um, whether it's shoes, like, all of that from Brooks, and like, what you've been most excited about, um, maybe in testing or things that are that are available now. Um. Yeah. So I would say that right now, one of some of my favorite things from them. Well, I really like this shirt. Uh, I don't even know what it's called, but everyone take a good look. It's on the website. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I really like it. It's like, it came out in the spring. Um, and then they also had an International Women's Day collection, a girl power tank, and then a girl's can shirt. Uh, big fan of those and women. Woo -woo. Um, and then my favorite shoes are the launch um, as far as like training goes, but they're new. Um, Hyperion Elite and Hyperion Tempo uh, racing flat shoes are super nice. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to run in the latest prototype that they sent mm -hmm. me, but I did wear them for a jaunt, uh, a walk around my apartment, mm -hmm. um, and I felt incredible. Um, so usually the stairs really get me, but in those shoes, man, it was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. Right. Nice. Um, oh, and then my other favorite thing is the Cascadia Thermal Mittens, um, because my hands are always cold. Uh, so I pretty much just wear mittens like below 50 degrees. Yep. Got them on. Um, and it's funny because like nothing else is ever cold. Like I'm notorious for wearing shorts like every day during the winter, mm -hmm. but it'll be shorts and mittens day at all the time. <laughs> That's awesome. Nice. So the Cascadia Mittens from Brooks. I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, what are your, you know, just to dig into the details a little bit more, some of your favorite Brooks tools, uh, what are your favorite, you know, kind of top three shoes for recovery days, longer workouts and, and track sessions? Yeah, so I would say that, um, like I said, my favorite for just normal training days would be the launch. Mm -hmm. And then for like super recovery days, uh, I like the ghost. They're really soft and cushioned. Um, and like probably one of the most popular book shoes. Yeah. Uh, and then as far as workouts go, uh, anything on the track uh, that's like a little longer, like K's through miles and then up to like tempos and all of that. I just say Hyperion Elite because they're like mm. just really shoes. Um, and then the classic Hyperion for like shorter stuff, like a 200 or 400. Cool. Nice. Awesome. Uh, I can get behind that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, Nate, you ran in some Hyperions recently. I think that was what you ran your your 5K. And is that, am I making that up? I might be making that up. You're making that up, Ashley. It's <laughs> fake news right I've there. I've talked about liking the Hyperions. <laughs> no, I'm excited. I really want to run in the Hyperions. I haven't gotten a chance to run in them yet. Um, you know, but, um, but we'll see. We'll see what happens in the future. <laughs> so, Ali, through our awesome Together We Move sessions, we've really gotten to talk to to runners of all different uh, experience levels and, and different places in their careers, from from Des Linden, who we got to speak with a couple weeks back, to Dina Castor, um, to to some uh, younger athletes such as yourself. We spoke with Molly Sedell last week, which was really fun. Uh, and one of the things that has come up that I've seen when I talk to older athletes or even athletes like Dathan Ritzenhain when they were younger, social media didn't exist. Their only job really was to run fast. And now it seems not only is your job as a young professional to run fast, but also have some sort of presence on social media. And we just wanted to know, like, 
is that something that has come natural for you? Do you, how did you have to learn it? Did you have to work with it? Um, yeah, like what's that been, what's that been like? I think social media uh, can be a really great tool and provides a lot of opportunities for athletes, you know, to endorse products that aren't just their, the brand of clothes or shoes that they wear, you know, you could, you know, have um, food or supplements or, you know, a, a mattress or whatever. Um, and it can also be like, obviously not the best thing if you get too into it, or um, it becomes a huge part of your identity. But I really enjoy social media. And for me, um, I just try to be really authentic. And um, people talk about like building a brand. And I'm just like, well, uh, I'm just going to be myself. And hopefully that's uh, some sort of brand. Um, so yeah, I just, I just try to, you know, say pretty much what I want to and it'll let people kind of get a sense of my personality. Um, and just not overthink it, not not make it a job, just let it be something that's more relaxed. Mm -hmm. Do you feel as so, like a, I was going to say, do you feel as a, like a professional runner uh, that you're being looked at as like, oh, you need to post a certain regularity. Uh, does it feel like work or does it still feel like this fun thing that you just kind of do when you want? Yeah, to me, like, I do feel like I, I should post about, you know, what I'm doing day to day, uh, at least somewhat, you know, on my story and that because people follow me and they kind of want to know, you know, what I'm doing for training or what I'm eating and those sorts of things. Um, but it's not like it's in my contract that I need to post every day of the week. And so I don't feel much pressure um, whenever I'm posting something. It's because I think it's, you know, at least semi interesting um, or I just feel like it. Uh, it's not really a like chore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things that's that can be so cool about social media now is that like you do have this opportunity to share like mm -hmm. who you are authentically with your audience, which it sounds like is is what you want to do. And so within that, do you feel like not that you have an obligation, but that you that you want to that you want to share this piece of something um, like maybe even with younger audiences or inspire others who are looking up to you? Like, is there something you, you want to portray for them to like, almost like inspire them or motivate them in, in some way through what you're doing? Like, does that cross your mind in what you're doing? Um, yeah, a little bit. I think that um, obviously social media is a great way to connect with fans and, and followers and just different people in the sport. Uh, and so I hope that through, you know, what I'm doing in training and, and working hard and in racing and in representing Brooks, which is a brand that I truly believe in, that I can inspire people. And um, I really enjoy like getting DMs and being able to connect with um, fans or just <laughs> people from all over who for some reason, find my life interesting. Um, that's always kind of shocking to me because I'm like, no, I'm really so boring. I just run and lay on the floor and and eat. And, you know, I'm not doing that much, but um, I appreciate it that people want to hear about my journey and are interested in it. Okay, so yes, you laying on the floor. This is something that's in your Instagram, um, your Instagram profile. You've got to tell us more about this. Uh, I mean, it really kind of describes itself. It's just basically <laughs> that you get done with training or maybe you just know that you have really hard training that's about to happen and you just, you can't do anything. You need a zero energy activity and you can't even make it to the couch or the bed or anything. Like you just lay down on the floor, lay down on the floor and that's just all. Yeah. <laughs> and then when it's time to eat... We were talking about this before we went live. You've got to tell us what you like to eat, your favorite type of food. Actually, can you start by telling us what you had for lunch today? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Throwing you on the yeah. spot, Allie. Uh, my lunch was pretty random, so it was a combo of leftovers. We had leftover spaghetti and lentils. So I mixed those with kale and some carrots, and I had a lentil spaghetti salad sort of thing yeah um but 
actually, I've given this sort of meal a name because it's pretty common one for me. So I call it a bof, which is B-O-F and stands for bowl of food. Um, my sister and I are crazy about bowls of food. You can make them so good. I mean, you just throw whatever you have in a bowl and you call it dinner, you call it lunch, sometimes breakfast. It's great. <laughs> Does it have to be a bowl or can it be a plate? Oh. I mean, it can be a plate. Um, it's usually a bowl because it's it it's more conducive to mixing. Mm. But uh, if you're out of bowls, you know, they're all in the dishwasher. In, in dire straits, you can use a plate. Mm. Yes. But it is not know. recommended, people. <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> with you on that. territory, and we're talking about boffs here. <laughs> <laughs> not puffs. Not puffs. Boffs. Yeah. Oh, exactly. So I wanted to follow up one one more on on the social media side. Uh, I think something that I know a lot of uh, creators in the space are sometimes battle or aware of runners, coaches, and just everyone, uh, they, they sometimes like really get into social media and then they get burned out on it. They realize like, oh man, like I need a break. I need to step away. Do you have, have you found yourself having to put any type of guardrails up? Has it been particularly hard, especially if you've gone through periods of injury where you haven't been able to run that you like, oh, I, I shouldn't look at this or does looking at it help? Um, I think for me, I haven't had to take time away from social media. Um, I haven't like really had a huge barrier that I crossed. Um, but I also don't follow a ton of professional runners. And I mm. like to shout out to any professional runners watching this. It's not because I don't respect you. Like I have a huge amount of respect for mm. uh, ladies in my event and in the other events. Like I, I really think that they're good and their social media is probably great, but I find that if I follow too many people, I just end up doing a lot of like comparisons and feeling inadequate. Mm. And so that's just not conducive to me being my best. And I, I know that about myself. So I kind of have to draw the line there. Interesting. Did you yeah. find yourself like following some runners and it was like, Ooh, this is kind of getting my head. And did you have like a day where it was like, I got to like delete a bunch of people or did you just like never really follow them in the beginning? Like, Ooh, this isn't a good idea. Yeah. So it was kind of, it was kind of uh, the second one there. I never really followed people where like, I kind of started following a few and then I was like, Oh no, let's back it up now. Um, and just decided to kind of stay away from doing that. Oh man. So I have to, I have to ask one more thing. What's, what's your, well, I'll ask more than one more thing. As I say, what's your favorite non running thing to follow on Instagram or on social uh, media? Yeah. So I really like following rock climbers. Um, like, uh, Sasha de Gulen, or I actually don't know how to say her last name. Um, and like Alex Honnold and stuff. Uh, I went through a pretty big rock climbing phase for like a year and a half during college where mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it. And both my roommates were rock climbers, um, worked at the rock gym and stuff. So that was super fun. And, and now I like to follow those athletes because it's, it's a really different sport, but also just like I've actually kind of gotten into it a bit so I can understand like how impressive everything they're doing is. Yeah, that's cool. Um, okay, let's do a few more rapid fire questions if oh, we yeah. can. Several I definitely think we should get through. Um, are you ready for another round, Allie? Yes, yes. Let me get a little sip and then I'll be ready to spurt it out. Perfect. Okay. So, <clears throat> what is the hardest part about being a runner and being from Alaska? <laughs> uh, you know, I think the hardest part about being a runner is... Um, being able to know when you need to take a break uh, mm -hmm. and knowing when you're like a good amount of tired and you can keep pushing. And yeah. being from Alaska, the hardest part is surviving the winter. Mm, totally. I can imagine that. Do you think steeplechase would make you a good Spartan athlete? I, I don't think so. Spartans do like spear throwing and I've heard about like getting sh electric shocked during a race and things like that. None of that happens in the steeplechase. Like you think I'm much cooler than I am. Like that, I no, 
<laughs> so do you have any advice for college D1 runners? Uh, I would say just, you know, enjoy your time in college. Like, obviously, some people get to run pro, but for a lot of people, that's like their last experience of being on a team and having that team aspect. And so they just appreciate that and like really embrace working hard, like for the group and not just for yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is good. But that is good advice right there. Um, do you ever want to run a long, hard trail race in the mountains? Oh, Sometime for sure. in the yeah. future. <laughs> that that's definitely I was actually just talking about this yesterday like I think that that would be a really fun thing to get into kind of like after I'm done on the track uh you know doing trails and ultras and things like right up my alley for sure mm-hmm. um what's the heaviest thing you've ever lifted in your life and this could be anything it doesn't have to be weights um well I can't really think of something heavy I lifted that wasn't weights not again to like boulders and things like that um I would say like probably squatting I think I squatted like 175 once oh um, that's awesome <laughs> that's really really cool. cool are you still lifting right now uh so I I haven't really been we've been doing like some kettlebell workouts and just body weight circuit stuff, but I haven't had access to a gym until actually today I bought a gym membership because I'm in Idaho and they've opened gyms back up here. Yeah. Cool. What's your, I'm just, I'm just going, I'm just going off the cuff for a second for, for strength stuff. But, uh, what's your like favorite piece of strength equipment? Like, is it a kettlebell, a dumbbell? Is it nothing? (laughs) I hate all of them. Uh, yeah, I would say like either a TRX or a kettlebell. I think both of those are just super versatile. Like I love having a barbell and being able to do, you know, like back squats and deadlifts and things like that. But as far as like the number of exercises you can do, I feel like kettlebell and the TRX are pretty solid. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, Okay. So if you had to choose between kale or spinach, which would you choose? Uh, I think I'd go with spinach. Uh, I do love kale, but spinach is like much easier to eat when just in like it's pure raw form. Like mm-hmm. it was in a hurry, you know, like I needed to make a, a quick boff, then spinach would probably be the best option. Yeah. Okay. Now what if you could only eat one food for the rest mm-hmm. of your life, you could only eat that food. Like you can't, it couldn't be like pizza because pizza has like tomatoes and cheese and bread. It could just be like tomatoes or cheese. Like it's one item, regardless of the nutritional quality. Uh, probably ice cream. <laughs> I'm tired of it, honestly. Like, I yeah, it would always be good. I'm a big cool. ice cream fan myself. Um, yeah. That is so good. Uh, any pre-race superstitions? Oh, we already did that one. Oh well, yeah, you kind of about that one i haven't developed any new ones since last time <laughs> oh good since <laughs> we asked you earlier today <laughs> no i yeah the last 20 minutes i haven't thought of anything yet but maybe another 20 and i will <laughs> okay so if you have like one piece of advice for um someone who's just starting running maybe it just someone who's young in high school um what would your advice be just for getting started in track or just in running in general about pursuing the sport? Um, I would say like, don't feel like you have to go from like not running to being running year round. Like it's totally okay to like do it seasonally when you're in high school and do other sports and, you know, take time to just be a normal kid like I think that right now high schoolers are just getting so serious about running so quickly and like I didn't I didn't run year round until college I played basketball in high school Mm. and I think that that was really fun for me and like that was the last time I'm ever going to competitively play basketball so I'm glad that I like took that opportunity yeah yeah that is cool that is cool well Allie we could continue to pick your brain on on all things Alaska and steeplechase and uh, bowls of food. 
we got to do our drawing for a giveaway. Ashley, do you know who the winners okay. are? Um, our two winners, one is actually from Boise, Idaho. Am I saying Boise correct? Uh, it's Boise, like Boise. Boise, I know. Yeah. I'm from the East Coast, and I used to say Oregon, and I've gotten better. <laughs> but when I still talk to, uh, you know... My folks out there, they'll, they'll, they'll reference that every once in a while. So Oregon and Boise. So Boise State or Boise or whatever. Uh, I just got totally off the cuff. Just I got, all, I, got all, I got all mixed up talking about that. So our two winners, without going crazy here, Shayna Scott, longtime TRE listener. Shayna Scott, congratulations. You are one of our winners from LaGrange, Illinois. And Robin Pettit yeah. from Boise, you are also our winner. So, Shayna, I see you in the comments. Fantastic. Uh, Robin, make sure you say hello, and we will get you connected with your virtual shoe fitting, your shoes, and your annual membership. So cool. Okay, Allie. So before we go, um, we look to our guests for, like, this final bit of wisdom or it doesn't even have to be wisdom, just parting words that you want to leave with the running community now. Um, what, what would you say to everyone? I mean, we are in such a very unique circumstance right now, especially with like races, seasons, everything put on hold. Um, what's your message? <laughs> yeah. I would say just, you know, take this time to, really appreciate like the purity of running and that you don't need a gym or anything special to do it. Um, and races being canceled, take maybe, you know, do something different than you would and train for an off event or just change up your training, run exactly when you want to and when don't, when you don't, um, and just kind of like use the time to just appreciate it for whatever it is. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really great. Just being able to like, let it be what it is. And, and like you said, finding the purity in this sport. Um, is there something that you've, is there like something in your training or just like in your mindset that shifted during this period at all? Um, and how you've approached your own training? Um, so like, obviously my training is really different cause I've been, yeah. uh, hot running. Yes. Uh, have been running a little bit lately and I was seven mile week last week. So it's ramping up pretty quick. Um, but yeah, I would say that like, I usually when I'm injured, I get pretty stressed about like losing fitness or not being where I need to be when I start running again. Um, but having the quarantine and all of this happening with the season and uncertainty, um, has kind of helped me relax a little bit and be like, you know what, you're doing everything you can. And, um, you're going to have time to rebuild when this is all over. So, yeah. Yeah. I love it. Are there Great. more than one event you're you're targeting for the uh, Olympic trials? I know the steeplechase is a big one, but are you also looking at any of the other track events? Uh, I don't know, really. Like, I, I do really want to try to explore more of, like, what I could do in the 10K because um, I've only raced it a couple times. Um, and then I, you know, enjoy the 5k too. So it's just going to be, we're just going to have to see like how I'm feeling leading into next year. Now that, I mean, there's over a year until it even happens. Mm -hmm. We shall see what happens. Well, Ali, thank you so much for spending an hour with us and, uh, getting to know you a little bit more. Um, we wish you the best of luck in this time and getting back to full health and seeing you hopefully in Tokyo next year, right? That would be that would be the cool thing. Yes, yeah, thank you for having me. And once again, I think it's so cool what you're doing. And for everyone on the show, hopefully you will join the virtual race at whatever distance you please. Um, and yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Yeah, oh, very quickly, where can our audience find you if yeah. they want to uh, follow you a little bit more? Uh, yeah, my social media, pretty much just Instagram. It's Allie underscore Ostrander. Um, and it's the same on Twitter, but I'm not super active there. Although you could just look at my profile photo. Um, that would be pretty fun. <laughs> awesome. Love it. Awesome. 
Well, Allie, thank you. thanks you again. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in and watching all these live shows. Uh, it's been such a pleasure. And we are really excited to finish things off with a bang for the My Virtual Run. So make sure you go sign up for that. And uh, we will be running with you on Wednesday. All right, right. guys. Bye. Happy Global Running Day <laughs> in a few days. <laughs>